Recording in progress. Good evening, everyone. I apologize for being late. This is the call to order of the open public session of the Herupa Unified School District Board of Education. Desee almost recordarles que esta reunión se transmite simultaneamente en español. Si desee escuchar la interpretación en español de esta reunión, Accede al enlace incluido, incluido en la agenda disponible, disponible en la página web del distrito. Gracias. To everyone speaking tonight, please remember that our translator is providing simultaneous translation and speak a little more slowly. Thank you. Mrs. Borley, would you conduct the roll call, please? President Karen Bradford. Here. Clerk of the Board, Melissa Regal. Present. Dr. Eric Dittweiler. Here. Robert Garcia. Present. Joseph Navarro. Present. Student Board members, Priscilla Perez. Present. Haley Bisbee. Present. Erica Bradamondo. Present. Mariana Leno Cardenas. Your microphone not working? Okay, present. Mariana is present. Staff advisors, Dr. Trenton Hansen. Present. Daniel Brooks. Present. Dave Dubrowski. Present. Paula Ford. Present. Rosa Santos Lee. Present. Thank you. Tonight's flag salute will be led by Mrs. Lisa Cook from Camino Real Elementary School, and please remain standing afterwards. Tonight, the proverbial cherry on the top of our Pledge of Allegiance is an audio-visual performance from our Pacific Avenue Academy of Music presented by a sixth grader, Cameron Braun. This is Cameron's second year playing the saxophone. His first year of learning the sax was entirely through virtual learning last school year. He is the saxophone section leader this year and also is in Pam's music technology. So let us enjoy the following. Thank you. 
Cameron, if you're listening, there are a whole there's a whole room of people smiling with their eyes for you. Thank you so much. I also have moments of silence tonight as we remember two individuals who are important parts of our students' daily lives. First, Ms. Rita Lang, who was employed with the district for 22 years from 1996 to 2018. She worked as an elementary media clerk at Glen Avon Elementary. She was known to her coworkers as an excellent baker who made delicious cookies. We also remember Mr. Basil Slaymaker, who was one of our teachers for 34 years from 1975 to 2009 at Troth Street Elementary School at Glen Avon Elementary. We extend our sympathies to their families. And in our moments of silence, I will think about the hundreds of students' lives whom they touched during their careers. Please join me. Please be seated. I will provide tonight's inspirational comment because I found a quote that I think is marvelous guidance for all of us, especially for our students to learn early in life. It is from William Arthur Ward, an American philosophy writer who lived from 1921 to 1994. He wrote, do more than belong, participate. Do more than care, help. Do more than believe, practice. Do more than be fair, be kind. Do more than forgive, forget. Do more than dream, work. Now, reports from closed session, Mr. Brooks. Thank you, President Bradford. In closed session by a unanimous vote of five to zero with all trustees voting in favor and none opposed, the board voted to appoint Ms. Lynette Bowen as assistant principal at Camino Real Elementary. And Ms. Bowen is here. Would you stand, please? Uh, congratulations, Ms. Bowen. And I believe Mrs. Santos Lee also has several items to report. Please. Thank you. In closed session, the board in a 5 0 vote agreed to a settlement in the Office of Administrative Case. 202-1050-181, resolving all issues in the dispute. In closed session, the board in a 5-0 vote agreed to a settlement in Office of Administrative Case 202-1050-888, resolving all issues in the dispute. And lastly, in closed session, the board in a 5-0 vote agreed to a settlement in the Office of Administrative Case 202-1040-452, resolving all issues in the dispute. Thank you, Mrs. Santos Lee. Tonight, welcome to everyone. We know your time is limited and precious, and we appreciate that you choose to spend your set Monday night with us in the business of our school district. Thank you. Dr. Hansen, would you like to welcome our students, school board members? Yes, thank you. We're certainly excited to have these young ladies here with us tonight and happy to hear from, from each of them as they give a report about their high school uh, activities and things that are taking place at their schools. We'll start tonight with Priscilla and just work our way down the table. So Priscilla, would you like to go first, please? Yes. Good evening, President Bradford, Dr. Hansen, trustees and cabinet. My name is Priscilla Perez representing Harupa Valley High School. I will start my report today talking about our sports teams. Our homecoming football game on September 17th ended with the victorious win against Paris High School with the score of 48 to 18 and boys water polo had a triumphant win over Notre Dame High School with a score of 21 to 6. Our girls golf is on a two game winning streak and girls volleyball is on a five game winning streak. Our homecoming week was held from September 13th to 17th and our spirit days leading up to homecoming football game. <clears throat> 
excuse me, and dance were advertised all over campus and our Instagram page where all were welcome to participate in dressing up. Our homecoming rally was held at the stadium where ASB decorated the stadium and introduced our fall sports as well as held fun games such as what we called Do It For Kobe, which was a game of 10 students volunteering to get as many basketballs through the hoop within 30 seconds and other fun races for students to participate in. Homecoming court for freshmen, sophomores, and juniors were crowned during the rally as well. The homecoming football game was decorated on all sides of our home side bleachers to show our Jack pride. And we even brought back our free merch ball, which was thrown into the crowd for whoever caught it was able to pick out an item of Jag's flag from our merch box. The homecoming queen was crowned during halftime. The homecoming dance was held in the quad where all was lit up with the DJ's lights and ASB provided a projector in the quad playing TV commercials from the 90s and 2000s. An ASB student kindly volunteered to let us use their 63 Impala as our photo booth background to go with our 90s slash 2000s theme. And the homecoming king was crowned during the dance. During September, we had the following organizations provide valuable information to our student body during their lunch table ses sessions. UC Merced, Chafee Community College, US Marine Corp, La Sierra University, US Military, San Bernardino Valley College, U.S. Navy, University of Laverne, NCC, and the U.S. National Guard. Coming up to JVHS, we will be releasing three new scary stories on Thursdays and Tuesdays during lunch where students can access the stories on their phones and Chromebooks by scanning a QR code. Also coming up, we have Pink Out Week, this Pink Out game this Friday. That concludes my report. Mariana. Good evening, board members, cabinet, and community members. Did you know that Riverside has about 3,000 homeless people? Did you know that there's a way for you to help bring them some comfort as the cold weather approaches? And whether we like to call the month of October, Socktober. We encourage our students, staff, and even you to donate pairs of socks that will be sent to a local homeless shelter. If you would like to donate socks, you can drop them off at Nueva Vista front office. Tell them that Mariana sent you. This event is, right, is run by our amazing Miss Napari. October is a busy month. We are having friendly advisory competition during October 18th through the 22nd. Classes will be decorating their doors in as much pink as possible for the breast cancer awareness. This Friday, October 22nd is National Wear Pink Day. So we will be judging the doors and encouraging students and staff to wear pink. Board, mem board members and cabinets, if you would like to show your support, take a picture of yourself wearing pink, tag us on Instagram at Nueva underscore ASB or email your pictures to Claudia underscore Ms. McMains at jusd.k12.ca.us. The week of October 23rd through the 29th, the campus will be participating in Red Ribbon Week. Ms. Lapari has started a club called ASIC Service Club. Students have been giving up their lunch to create cards for kids that are in the hospitals. Next quarter, we will we are going to make blankets, blanket buddies for babies that are in the ICU. Nova had our second fun Friday this of the year, which was sports day. We encouraged we enjoyed burgers grilled by our teachers and staff as we ran fun, fun games for students to play. Our next fun Friday is October 29th. Our career center will be hosting our annual college and career kickoff day. The event will take place on Tuesday, October 19th. On this day, we will showcase the various colleges, training and career opportunities available to our students. Seniors will be working on their college and financial aid applications while juniors attend presentations and explore different careers. All students will have the chance to connect with local colleges, representatives, military recruiters, and potential employers during our lunch career fair. Additional presentations and workshops will be held throughout the month to encourage students to work towards their post-graduation plans. Our first quarter is coming to an end, which is Friday the 8th. We look forward to celebrating some of our aspects that will be graduating this day. Thank you again for welcoming me to the last meeting. Have a good evening. Thank you, Haley and Patriot High School.
Good evening, Superintendent Hansen, board members, and cabinet. As of October 4th, Patriot has much planned for these upcoming months. To begin, I would like to acknowledge our annual blackout game, which will be hosted this Thursday, October 7th at Herpa Valley High School, beginning at 7 p.m. The following week, ASB will host our Homecoming Spirit Week, inspired by Halloween and the homecoming theme of Horror Nights, beginning Monday and concluding Friday. As I mentioned during our previous meeting, this year's rally will be a week-long event taking place during lunch. Hosted by the four class councils on our campus, freshmen will begin the Spirit Week on Monday with a lunchtime activity, followed by sophomores, juniors, and seniors who will occupy Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday's lunch. Class councils have also each been tasked with the responsibility of decorating our B and D building hallways. Prior to the games hosted by each class council during lunch, sports divided by day will walk into the quad and perform their cheers, representing the varsity teams on campus and advertising their upcoming sporting events. Students and clubs have also applied to be in the rally, some singing and others dancing to showcase their talents. During the rally, students with the highest honors on our campus will also be showcased by means of emblems decorating the hallways. On the final day, SOS Entertainment will DJ at the conclusion of lunch after our final performances. The evening of Friday, October 15th will be our homecoming game at Rubido against La Sierra. Also hosted by ASB in collaboration with SOS Entertainment will be our 2021 Horror Night Homecoming on Saturday, October 16th from 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. Tickets are currently being sold at lunch up until the Friday prior to our dance. Beyond our sporting events and homecoming festivities, ASB has begun a lunchtime activity referred to as Warriors Got Talent in resemblance of America's Got Talent, allowing our Warriors on campus to exhibit their hobbies and talents, designating a winner by means of teachers on campus who have volunteered as judges. Advertised according to posters in our hallways, as well as on our student spot page, Warriors scan a provided QR code from which they are directed to a Google form where they can request a position in the event. ASB will host this event once every month after October, having begun September 22nd and continuing November 3rd. As a reward, the winning student is given a voucher to our student store as well as a basket of treats. On November 5th, ASB, in collaboration with the clubs on campus, will host a fall carnival beginning at 3.30 and concluding at 5.30, inclusive of games, booths, and a pumpkin patch, according to donations. Upcoming, Patriot plans to participate in the Thanksgiving canned food drive, yet to determine whether we will independently host the service or donate to the district. As my final report, ASB and administrators on Patriot's campus are currently in the process of establishing a House of Representatives through which we intend to better represent our student body and advocate for the many voices on our campus. On Monday and Friday of the final week of every month, class council presidents will lead a congregation of 50 elected representatives, one from each of our advisory classes, during advisory in a discussion considering any concerns or suggestions students may have for our school. Leading up to the monthly meetings, each advisory class will submit a Google form voicing their concerns and ASB will note the three most pressing issues to be discussed on our campus, constructing a meeting agenda according to student input. On Mondays, freshmen and sophomores will meet, while on Fridays, juniors and seniors will meet, thereby dividing and containing the number of students in each of our meetings. According to the feedback collected from such meetings, ASB will meet among themselves or with administrators to discuss our approach to such considered matters and next steps moving forward. That is all I have for you today. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, Erica from Rubino High School. Thank you for having me here today and allowing me to share with you what Rubino has done for the past few weeks. Uh, last time we met, I mentioned that Rubino was celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month and that was a success. Three Roberto students volunteered to perform in the quad during lunch and everyone was thrilled. Lots of people participated, danced and so on. We even went viral on TikTok. Uh, culinary also was handing out free tacos and Metro Club was handing out free conchas and cookies. That day was a complete success due to two ASB students named Liliana Figueroa and Kylie Carmona. Many students are excited to see what we have for them this month, which would be Italian American Heritage Month. As sports, girls volleyball and girls tennis are doing well in the league. Cross has their first league match and the team is looking solid with multiple wins in their preseason. Last week was homecoming week. As royalty campaigned all week and flow building was in process as well, ASB was getting ready for the first school's rally. The rally was a great success and many students are thrilled to see what ASB has in store for them in the next rally. Last Friday night, football won their first league game against Pacific. Rubero's home side was completely packed, even with the classes of 1979 and through 83. 
um, they joined us. Former NFL player Solomon Wilcox, who did attend Rubido High School, participated participated in the coin toss before the game. At the game, royalty was crowned, and three former homecoming queens from 1980 through 82 helped crown this royalty. This year's homecoming king and queen is Edson Bonilla and Alyssa Marque. The dance was a, the next day, and 400 people attended. Homecoming week was a great victory. Thank you for allowing me to share what Rubido has done for the past few weeks. Thank you very much, ladies. Um, President Bradford, that concludes our report from our student board members. Thank you, students. And please remember that you have the discretion to stay or go depending upon your homework schedule. Thank you very much. Agenda item two, board comments. May we start with you, Trustee Dittweiler, please. Uh, first, I would like to thank Mr. Brooks for hearing my plea for meaningful subject headers and emails from the district. I am starting to see them in emails about COVID protocols and trust that they, like names of school sites, the district itself and the from header will propagate out into standard usage over the course of the next few weeks. I appreciate this as a parent because it lets me quickly decide which of the many messages I get are important and I need to and need to be read. I appreciate this as a trustee because I believe it will increase parent engagement across the district and have a positive impact on student learning outcomes. When I read the report on our LCAP coming back from the County Office of Education, I immediately understood why we would rather talk about inputs than outcomes. Not only are outcomes beyond our complete control, but the county report also showed that they are not very good as we seldom meet the standards. A look around the region shows that we are in good company, on par with Rialto and Compton, but better than Hammett, Albert, and San Bernardino, and solidly behind Claremont, Chino Valley, and Corona Norcor. Not happy with the five color speedometers, I went off to the California Department of Education data portal and downloaded a bunch of files. Dr. Tidwell, can you speak into the microphone, please? Thank I'm you. sorry. I downloaded a bunch of files, the largest of which had more than three and a half million records. I assembled a relational database of the 2018-2019 data from the files and distilled the data down to just our 17 elementary offering schools. I took data on the percent of students who were English learners and the percent who received free or reduced price meals and plotted them against the percent in each grade's English, language arts, and mathematics tests who met or exceeded the standard. I then drew regression lines on top of my scatter plots. Schools above the regression line are punching above their weight and doing more with less. They have less affluence and less English fluency, yet their students do well on the tests. These schools stand in defiance of James Coleman's 1965 conclusion that demography is destiny. But how do they do it? Are the students otherwise the same, or is there a missing variable? What are these schools doing that others with similar inputs but different outcomes are not? These are questions that we should be asking. I have been told, unofficially of course, that Camino Real is our best elementary school. While it is true that it often has the highest percent meeting or exceeding the standard, it is almost always under the regression line. Its successes are driven by inputs as well as the treatments. In contrast, Glen Avon is well above the regression line in each of the 16 graphs that I drew. Somehow the staff in Glen Avon are making learning happen despite challenging inputs. We should ask them to share their wisdom with the rest of us. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Navarro, please. Thank you, President Bradford. Um, I would just like to uh, my sympathies to the Slaymaker family and especially to the Lang family. Uh, Rita Lang was the mother of one of my best friends. Um, she was always inviting, welcoming a great lady and she will be greatly missed. Um, it just really hurts my heart and my soul to, to see the family going through that. So if you guys know the family, please uh, send your sympathies uh, to them. Um, I'm excited to see that we have more of our testing facilities open. I think I counted 25 on that. Is that correct, Dr. Dr. Hansen? We're at 25? Closer to 19, 18 or 19? 19. So we do have 
19 uh, testing sites throughout the district. Uh, also, I encourage you, there's some more upcoming vaccine clinics, uh, October 6th and 27th at the Rupa, at the district, uh, district Parent Center. We have October 9th and 30th at the Riverside Univ University Health System, October 22nd at the uh, Bonds and Albertsons, and October 23rd at uh, Riverside University Health Systems. Again, all these dates and all this information for the COVID is on our website. So please, I implore you to, uh, to check that out. I wanna thank our student board members for being here. I um, appreciate uh, all the input you get us. And uh, Mariana, you are 100% right. Socks are number one items that homeless uh, um, facilities are asking for. So if you guys have any extra socks or feel free when you're at Walmart to, to get a cheap big pack and donate them, I implore you that socks are so much needed for their uh, well being and, and, and care of their feet. So I appreciate you bringing that up. And uh, I just wanna thank our teachers of the district. I know that uh, you're feeling the burden right now being short staffed, but the uh, district office is doing everything they can to really help you out and, and get some more subs. So just hang in there and just know that we're thinking about you. And that is it. Thank you, Trustee Garcia, please. Thank you, President Bradford. Um, first of all, I wanna, as my colleague here said, I wanna encourage vaccination. So there's plenty of, plenty of vaccination sites out there. So please, um, Take advantage of it uh, so we can so we can get rid of this thing. Um, again, thank you to student board members. Um, what I really liked about your reports tonight were uh, there was a component of, of community service, whether it was pink out, uh, homeless, uh, canned food drive, Hispanic Heritage Month. So that's it's really great. Thank you for sharing today. I'm gonna try to find a pink shirt, Marianne. I don't know if I can find one, but um, I'll see if I got one back home. And uh, I also want to thank um, uh, Director of Language Services, Ms. Martha Gomez. She joined us this last uh, Saturday at our Riverside County School Board Members Association uh, meeting. And she presented the dual immersion, dual language immersion program uh, to the folks on the call. So thank you, Martha and your team. And finally, I want to thank, uh, I want to congratulate uh, Ms. Lynette Bowen on your appointment tonight. And um, I want you to know that the board has a bit of confidence in you, uh, I know administration does, and we look forward to, to great things from you. So thank you. That's all I have, Madam President. Thank you. Trustee Rogo, please. Thank you, President Bradford. Um, I just definitely want to echo um, Trustee Garcia's uh, mention of the student board members. You really bring up community and, and for young adults, it's really important. It is. It, the, the sooner you volunteer within the community and, and work together to find resources or support or socks um, for the homeless, it's, it's really important. Um, the, the, that makes the community strong, that if we all support each other. So I, I love hearing that it's beyond the football games and activities, and, and, and I value those. So don't, don't get the wrong impression, but Thank you so much. I mean, we are getting into the cold season, so the stocks and the food, and um, you know, there's there's food poverty out there due to this pandemic, um, unemployment, and and various reasons. So, really, we, I'm glad we are doing something, and so um, I look forward to hearing more updates and the progress after that, and as well as the um, staff. Yes, I know it's it's exhausting, you know, trying to find enough subs or filling positions where we're continually advertising those open spaces in, in my industry too. It's it's something that I can absolutely relate to. And I mean, we're sitting up here tonight and and I sympathize for the, everybody that's going out there on the campuses to ensure our students and the resources as well as the staff support it. It is exhausting. You know, we're, we're trying to hire 20,000 people across the nation and we can't do it. Um, so whether it's public sector or private sector, it's it's shorthand and and I know it's a lot of work and I just express my gratitude and how thankful I am that we're sticking to it to ensure that ultimately our students are getting their education. And that's all they have for today. Well, impromptu, I'll round out the importance of SOCs by talking about a comparison with horses. In horses, there's an expression, no hoof, no horse. And you probably recognize the phrase, for the want of a shoe, a kingdom was lost in the old days when warfare was on horseback. So 
and more recently in Forrest Gump, how, what was it, Cap, was it Captain Dan? Talk, Lieutenant, Lieutenant Dan talked about always take care of your feet. And I think about Sockies and children, how important. Thank you for thinking of those. I will give a commercial, however, for our graduating seniors to take it and their families to take advantage of the annual pathways to higher education college Wednesdays that start this Wednesday, October 6th through October 27th from 5.30 to 7 p.m. on Zoom. All of our students will have received this through their campus communications, and it's also available through the counselors. There will be information on the University of California, California State University, Common App and Community College application processes for students to have their questions answered. So for any students who are listening, please check on campus or with guidance counselors for the Zoom link to take advantage of this opportunity. Moving on to agenda item number three, public verbal comments. It is my pleasure to welcome all of the community members in attendance this evening. I would like to review a couple of items before we begin. Governing board meetings are a business meeting of the board held in public. And although public participation is encouraged, it is not the public's meeting. As the board president, it is my duty to maintain an orderly, respectful, full and peaceful meeting where all perspectives, voices, and opinions are welcome. Please refrain from speaking out while another person has the floor. I will recognize all individuals wishing to provide public comment one at a time to do so in accordance with board bylaw 9323. This communication opportunity is included on the agenda of each regular board meeting so residents can make suggestions or identify concerns about matters affecting the school district or request an item to be placed on a future agenda. The Harupa Unified School District Board of Education encourages and invites the public to comment on items listed on its agenda or on matters within its subject jurisdiction. Public speakers have a right to their own opinions and neither board members nor staff will be responding to those opinions. The district silence should not be mistaken for agreement but simply to avoid legal entanglements and or to protect the privacy of situations that may involve lawsuits, employee discipline, or dismissal. Please be assured any serious allegations have been or will be investigated thoroughly. Any responses from the board will take place during board member comments. Pursuant to JUSD's board bylaw 9323, each public comment submission will be allowed three timed minutes and comments will be limited to a total of 20 minutes per topic if there are multiple persons wishing to comment. Pursuant to section 54954.2 of the government code, no action or discussion shall be undertaken on any item not appearing on the posted agenda. I have two comments. Mrs. Olkin, do you wish to speak now or during the public hearings? Please. Just like I bring complaints from people that have gotten calls, I'd like to also thank Trent for having a meeting with me to discuss some concerns of the community. And I would like to thank him for acting on it. Um, it meant a lot, people noticed. I'd also like to thank Dana because I informed him that I had spoken to Trent 
and he also immediately acted upon the concerns that were given to me. I was going to do a presentation on the COVID situation and the concerns many sites have about how it's being dealt with, but I think I will give Daniel and Denise and their COVID staff a chance. Uh, I want to discuss it with them before I bring it to community so that they will have a chance to um, respond to the concerns that are out there. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Cook, do you want to speak during the public hearing time for the trustee areas? Okay, there's a time for that then. We'll move on to agenda item four, administrative reports and written communications. Thank you, students. For a college and career update, Mr. Dubrovsky, please. Thank you. Well, it's a, it's a little bit hard to believe that we're already entering into college application season, but I guess November or October it is. Um, and tonight we have our amazing director of college and career readiness, Mrs. Roberta Pace, who will share some information on college and career kickoff day, just a small part of one of the many things that we're doing. And darn, I'm sorry that I missed our student board members. I wanted to thank them for mentioning college and career kickoff day and the other things that they're doing. And Mrs. Bradford, thank you for promoting our workshops that start um, Wednesday night. Um, but the reason that I'm here today is to talk about a, a few of the things that the oh. district's doing to support college and career readiness for our students. And I'm going to talk Mrs. about- Mrs. Pace, uh, since our, our students are gone, could you take off your mask so you, you're a little muffled? Thank you. Happy to do that. Thank you. Um, but what I'd like to talk about tonight are a couple of things that have not, I think, come to the board or not come to the board in, in great detail or recent detail um, that we're doing to support our students. Uh, as you know, the, basically everything that we do here in Harupa Unified is geared towards um, supporting our students so that they all graduate college and career ready and I put a number of different examples up there on the screen um, and I know that you've heard about all of those things that, that we're doing um, but what I wanted to start off tonight was to talk about our college and career kickoff day efforts and this is something that the district started five years ago um, it was started by a small handful of districts in Riverside County and what we did was we realized that in order to help support our seniors to get those college applications done, to get that financial aid application done, the California Dream Act application done, um, we couldn't rely on them just coming to workshops after school, um, to seeking out their counselor, to coming in and asking questions about doing that, that we needed to carve time out in the school day to get our students started and hopefully through those applications. And so that's how we started was working with just our seniors and we had workshops on each of the different college applications applications, their FAFSA applications, their DREAM Act applications. And as we reflected after the first year, we realized, hey, this is wonderful. All of our students need to be getting information to help better prepare them for their future um, so that they have a plan and they know exactly what they need to do to reach that plan. And so we took college and career kickoff day and we expanded it K-12. And so all of our schools sometime this month will be doing something in each of the grade levels that help our students research about different careers, um, explore different opportunities, learn about college options and things that are available to them post-graduation. Um, and we were one of two um, districts recognized by Riverside County Office of Education for taking those efforts K-12. Um, I have some pictures from 2019. Um, and what we did there. Um, that first picture up there is from Rustic Lane Elementary School. And um, one of the grade levels, they did um, career interest um, research projects. And so they had to put together a one page of information of a career that was of interest to them. And then they were given a little mini pumpkin and they had to decorate their pumpkin in the attire for that particular career. And then students from the other grade levels had the chance to go through their cafeteria and look at the pumpkins, but more importantly, read about those those different careers. Van Buren Elementary School invited um, seniors from Harupa Valley High School who had attended Van Buren Elementary to come and speak to their classes and to share their college plans and what they were doing to prepare for their futures. 
And then this is the gym at Rubido High School, and you can see a number of tables set up. And somewhere in the back, I'm there helping students with applications, but there were many of us that were there working with students on their applications for RCC in this particular room. Uh, the picture on the left was taken at Nueva Vista High School, and again, working on their applications for RCC and that one. And then if you look to the pictures that are on the right, those were taken at Harupa Valley High School, and this, they were focusing on having students complete their FAFSA or DREAM Act applications. And every time a student finished their application, they got to walk up and strike the gong. Um, and then the number went up to increase the numbers that have been completed. And by the end of those four hours there, I had such a headache from that gong, but it was well worth it. <laughs> Okay, um, on a more serious note, I wanna talk about why supporting a college and career culture really matters for us and for our students and our community. Um, this is information that I'm sharing um, that's pre-COVID. It's information that Riverside County of, on of Education pushed out, and it comes from the California Public Policy Institute. And if the Inland Empire was a state, we would be the 25th largest state in the nation based on our population. Okay, that blew me away, that the density of population and the number of young people that are here in the Inland Empire. However, I also have to report that the Inland Empire has the lowest college going rate of any major population area in the state. The only two areas that have lower rates than the Inland Empire are portions of the San Joaquin Valley and the counties in the farthest northeast portions of the state. And when we talk about college, we're not just talking about going off to that four-year um, university. We're talking about community college, vocational training, into the military, anything that provides post-graduation training or education for our students. Another set of statistics to share is that by 2025, which is the year that our current freshmen um, will graduate from high school, it is projected that 65% of the living wage jobs in our state will require a bachelor's degree or higher. And at our current rate of degree attainment, California will fall short of meeting this need by 5.6%. And when I first heard that, I go, well, that can't be too bad. It's just single digits, right? But that translates to 1.1 million degrees and positions that we're not going to be able to fill unless we're either producing more graduates with those degrees or importing people with those degrees. Also of note is that California currently ranks 40th in the nation for our college going rate. So when you think about 40th in the nation and then that we're the lowest going rate of any large population area, it's really quite telling. Okay. Another reason that, that it's important for us as a district is because it makes up part of our school accountability um, formula, and it appears on the California dashboard. It's the College and Career Index, or the CCI. And while that was not released last year, um, we still kept track of that data, and there are multiple ways that students can demonstrate their proficiency for being college and career ready, and it can be from state test scores, which our juniors or our seniors last year didn't have um, completion or attainment of the state seal of literacy, completing the 15 courses that make up the A through G um, coursework, com passing advanced placement exams, um, passing dual enrollment courses with a grade of C or higher, or completing a CTE pathway. Okay, so I want to also share some numbers that are pre or post and during COVID information for you. The most recent report that we've received from the National Student Clearinghouse is for the class of 2020. And what we saw there is that as a district, we saw our college going rate. And again, whether that's community college, vocational training, four year, whatever that was, it dropped by 9% for the class of 2020. And the biggest drop that we saw was for students um, in terms of going to a community college. We also kept track of our data and our figures for that CCI, even though that was not um, published. And overall, our um, college and career proficiency rate went down by 11.9% as a district. Part of that is because there were no test scores, and that is one way that students are able to demonstrate that. So across the state, um, many districts were affected by that. We also saw our A through G completion rate drop by 14.9%, but there is some good news in that as well, and that our rate of CTE pathway completion went up by 6.3%, and our dual enrollment participation with a grade of C or higher went up by 3.4%.
Okay, just real quickly, a couple of other things that are on my plate and that I work with is our district-wide AVID program, um, our advanced placement program um, that offers 24 different um, courses and exams to our students where they can earn college credit, career technical education where we have 25 different um, pathways for students across 10 different industry sectors, and then the work that we've been doing to increase guidance services at the secondary level and the curriculum in terms of guidance that's provided for students in grades K through 12. And again, that's also fairly unusual for our county. Okay. Have some more detailed information to share about our dual and concurrent enrollment programs. The first one is the Rubido Early College High School program, which is the longest running dual enrollment program that we have in the district. It is a very traditional early college model where they're recruiting students that tend to be at the top end of their class and they start taking college classes in their, in their junior and continue through their senior year. And all of those students complete at least a year's worth of college credit. And some of them are getting close to two years of college credit through that program. And they are taking classes in what's considered the general education or, or transfer program um, so that they can go on to a four-year degree program from this program. The next one that we have is our career and college access program. And this is something that was started by the state about four years ago. And it was looking at the idea that we have many students that are capable of doing college level work, but may not naturally think of themselves as being able and capable of doing that while still in high school. And so we recruit students from the academic middle and then currently are serving students in grades 10, 11, and 12. And we even have a few ninth graders that we sneak in um, when we can do that. And these courses are offered at Hoopa Valley, Patriot, and Rubido. And starting in the spring, we'll also have classes for Nueva Vista High School that are available. And they take a couple of different pathways. One is that academic transfer path. So they're taking courses similar to what students see in reaches. And then we also have CTE courses that our students are taking. And these include in, um, computer information systems, cybersecurity, administration of justice, and early childhood education. And then a third model that we have that's called concurrent enrollment is where we actually transport students to RCC and have them take CTE classes on that campus and in those facilities. And we're currently doing that for welding and for automotive repair. Um, and we're slated to expand that to Norco College in the spring if we can get the buses. That's the big qualifier there. Um, but they would be courses in game development, manufacturing and supply chain logistics. Okay. Another thing that you may not know about is that every May, um, each of the high schools puts on what's called a college signing day. And this is where they celebrate those seniors who have completed the things that they need to do to fulfill their plans for the future. So it's those students that um, applied to, got accepted and returned the intent to register to a four-year college, did what they needed to do um, to get registered for classes at the community college, got accepted into their vocational program, got accepted into an apprenticeship, enlisted into the military. And each high school handles it a little bit differently, but this is a picture from the 2019 celebration at Patriot High School. Um, they did it at lunch and it was a big, huge parade. It started with the, um, the drums and all kinds of noise and attention. And the students then marched behind banners of whatever their future plans were. So it's celebrating them, but also promoting to the underclassmen that this is something that's important. Okay, and I think the best way for me to wrap up the presentation is for you to actually hear from one of our recent students. This is Daniel Loza graduated from Harup Valley High School in 2018, and we had a chance to interview him this summer, and so I pulled a couple of snippets from him and just to hear the things that Harup Unified is doing to help our students reach their, their goals and their dreams for the future. So I was a student at um, NJUSD for my whole life. I went to a Mission Bell Elementary School, uh, of which I was there for five years, and then I went to Stone Avenue for my sixth grade. And then from Stone Avenue, I moved on to Rupa Middle School. And then from Rupa Middle School, I went to Rupa Valley High School from where I graduated in 2018. And then uh, shortly after graduating from uh, Rupa Valley High School, I moved on to the Universal Technical Institute, where I went and I studied uh, uh, diesel. Before graduating there, I applied for a light duty position in the school district, and that's where I got where I'm at now. 
So some of the CT programs that really helped me out a lot um, were building, uh, construction, and then automotive was a, was a big one. It really helped me to stay engaged in learning, being more of a physical learner, um, hands-on uh, learner compared to uh, in classroom all the time. Uh, but building and FFA were great, learning to work with animals, uh, learning to work with people that really helped me out and helped me become who I am today. Mr. Leach is an auto teacher at Hoopa Valley High School and he really helped me out a lot. He's, uh, he's pushed me along the way and I got to build my first engine with him. Um, learned a lot about brakes, electronics, uh, what to look for in the real world as well as what to do to be more valuable to an employer. Uh, so he, he really helped me out a lot and he's been my references uh, for college and for job applications here in the school district and I'm, I'm very happy that I was able to meet him and to have him as a teacher and a mentor. And, and I just want to share that since that was filmed this summer, um, he's been promoted. He's now a heavy duty mechanic um, for us. So I want to congratulate Daniel for that. Thank you so much. Are there any questions for Mrs. Pace? Please. Ms. Pace, I just have a question. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I just submitted a few notes where you're, there was concerns about the Inland Empire has the lowest college going rate. Are they, are they researching that, trying to look at finding the resources or um, is there enough colleges that for those San Joaquin and San, San Bernardino areas there is a lot of work that's being done we are just on the cusp of passing Orange County so oh, wow. we're so we're definitely making gains in that that area um, COVID kind of hit all of us um, and especially here in the Inland Empire, we were not the only district that saw a drop in our college going rate, but the efforts continue and um, we, we just keep plugging forward to make that difference for our kids. Okay, and then one other quick question. Uh, you mentioned about um, the COVID impact and then that there is a 9% drop rate. Mm -hmm. Is that indefinitely or is that just kind of you know some of these young adults are suspending it while they're trying to secure jobs or find new places to live or whatever the reasoning is i hope that that's what it is um what we do get is when we get our next round of data from national student clearinghouse it will include data on the class of 2020 and so i would hope and expect that would go up and historically we have seen about a two percent growth um, from year to year um, with our students going on. Okay, thanks. I mean, I know, I just know a student personally that it goes called loss, loss of family members. So, mm -hmm. I mean, these are, they're life changing circumstances. So, it's Absolutely. kind of not that it wasn't valuable at the time, but I think there's some circumstances that really um, are more important than, you know, continuing to enroll right. in school. And hopefully, right. some of these people will plan to re enroll. Absolutely. And one of the things that we did this summer is that we had um, counselors that worked uh, throughout the summer and that were available not only to the class of 21 graduates, but also to class of 2020. Gentlemen. President Bradford. I Please. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Pace, I, just, I don't have any questions. I just have some comments. Uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation. Great, great job. Uh, and thank you for Ms. Markham for being here as well. I'll support you there. Um, K through 12, I think that's fantastic. You know, let's start them young and get them in that mindset. Um, and the fact that we're only one of two districts in, I don't know, 23 districts in Riverside County, I think that's fantastic. And a couple of more points. Um, uh, I know they're all important, but, you know, right now, I think with all the global supply chain type of issues, it really highlights not that having more, uh, more people out there, but at least it kind of highlights how important that is. And also cybersecurity is very important. I think, I think Facebook had a problem today and um, kind of illustrates the fact that uh, how important that is. So thank you again. Trustee Navarro. I'm excited to see that CTE grew 6.3% uh, in dual enrollment uh, grow. What else can we do to help those numbers go up? 
I think one of the biggest things that we need to do is just get the word out to our students earlier. And one of the things that we instituted this year is what's called a six-year plan. So our counselors starting in seventh grade um, will be meeting with every student and actually documenting what's a career area that you're interested in, what's a possible CTE area that you're interested. Do you know that um, you can take college classes while you're in high school? And then the other thing is just to continue to nurture those relationships that we have with um, RCCD. Um, so whether whether it's um, RCC or Norco College. Um, and we're also um, hoping to expand out to Moreno Valley College and to bring on an interpreter's um, program, especially for our students in dual immersion. So. And then of course, probably with, with the COVID concerns, are we are not doing any like on-campus um, um, field trips to any college currently or? We uh, we are not, and most part of that is because the colleges are not open okay. either, okay. Um, and so they're not accepting that. But man, as soon as those doors are open, and as soon as we have buses, I'm going to get as many kids there as I can. <laughs> That's exciting. Here, is there any way to replace that temporarily? Maybe it's a presentation on these colleges, or maybe inviting students back to do a zoom call for classrooms to, to well, talk about their, their college experience you're or? describing many of the things that schools are doing for college and career kickoff day okay. um, they have graduates that are coming in via zoom we have um, some college students and college professors that are agreeing to come in via zoom um, to do that um, they're also taking advantage of the virtual tours that are available so students can at least see campuses that way excellent thank you appreciate it any other questions perfect I love your enthusiasm. Thank, thank you for being our students advocate. I think you're the perfect Always. person in that job. Thank you. Oh, thank you. It's a blessing to get to be here. So. Thank you. Moving along to agenda item 4B, review approval of 2021-2022, local control accountability plan in the 2021-2022 adopted budget misses board. Thank you. Uh, the Riverside County Office of Education has notified the district that its 2021-22 local control accountability plan and adopted budget have been approved. Ed code requires the County Office of Education review the district's local control accountability plan and budget and determine whether it adheres to the state guidance. And JUSD's LCAP and budget meets all the guidelines and it has been approved. The county letter is included in your backup material. Are there any questions on that? Trustee Dittweiler, please. Uh, on page four of the letter coming back from the county, there's one, two, three, four, five bullets or more than that with uh, suggestions of things we might do to improve things. What plans are we undertaking to, uh, to follow those suggestions through and, and make things better here? Yeah, it's, it's great identifying those things. One of the things, and, and we get these letters every year from the county, um, we, we as both ed services and pupil services now, because some of these fall within that domain, meet to sort of take a look at these questions, see the context of what we already have going on in the district that the county may not know about, and then look at you know what actions we might need to take to improve. So that's an ongoing process each time we go through this process with our COE. I have a question. Please. Thank you, President Bradford. So, so Mr. Dabrowski, so they're not what we might call non-conformances. There may be opportunities for improvement, you might call them. Yes. For example, the first bullet talks about how we might use the impact team model to um, promote the articulation of assessment scores and collaborative inquiry outcomes. And that's exactly what the impact team model does. So it, it was actually a little bit affirming because what they were asking us to consider is exactly what we what we already do. Okay. Thank you. Superintendent Hanson, do you have a comment? You look like you were in ready position. No. Any other questions, please? Mr. What is the mechanism for feeding back to the county what we've done and whether or not it worked? With regarding this pot, this letter, there is no mechanism. It's just simply the county's role is to approve the budget and the LCAP. And then if they see any you know, they ask these probing questions in their look at our data um, and then, you know, ask us to consider these things. And so we then consider and it's, and it's up to the district to then enact what they enact. We sometimes when those questions might lead us to uh, 
a desire to utilize some of their expertise and partner with them. Sometimes it leads to additional work that we might do with the county or additional work that we might do with other outside partners. Um, but there isn't an actual feedback loop between those questions and the county getting the answers. Have all of your questions been answered? Very good. We'll move on to C. Are there any other administrative reports? Not at this time. All right. We are, we'll now move on to the public hearing session. Item one, hold public hearing on intent to convey right of way to the city of Harupa Valley at Pedley School, Mrs. Ford. Thank you. Um, on September 13th, the board approved a resolution declaring its intent to consider the conveyance of a right-of-way located outside the south fence line of Pedley Elementary School to the city of Harupa Valley. As part of that process, Ed Code does require that the district hold a public hearing. And at this time, the board president should open the public hearing. Hey, let's do that. We will now open the public hearing on intent to convey a right-of-way to the city of Harupa Valley at Pedley Elementary School. Cool. Are there any members of the public wishing to speak on this item? Hearing none, this public hearing on the intent to convey a right of way to the city of Harupa Valley at Pedley Elementary School is hereby closed. We will move on to item two, hold public hearing regarding the composition of potential trustee voting areas associated with the district's transition to a by trustee area election system in advance of the preparation of draft trustee voting area plans by the district's demographer, Mrs. Ford, please. So in preparation for that draft trustee voting area plan, uh, I'd like to introduce Mr. Jonathan Salt from Fagan, Friedman and Fullfrost and Mr. Christopher, Christopher Melendez from Davis Demographics. They'll present information on the transition process to the by trustee area election system. Thank you. Good evening, members of the board, district staff, members of the community. Uh, I'm Jonathan Salt. I'm joined by Chris Melendez. Um, this presentation will mirror the presentation from a few weeks ago. This is the second pre-map public hearing. So once this is accomplished tonight, and if there's any additional feedback, Chris and his team can then actually draw draft map options for the district's consideration. So next time we'll be here, there'll be maps in front of you and maps in front of the community. We'll be fielding comments about what you like or don't like about those maps. So um, for those of you who haven't been here before, or for folks who are watching for the first time, a little bit of overview about how we got here. Um, the CVRA uh, prohibits the use of at-large election systems if that system impairs the ability of members of protected classes from electing candidates of choice or influencing the outcome of an election. Now you might think, well, we already have a trustee area, so what, you know, how does this apply to us? The district system is still considered at-large under the law because trustees are still elected by all voters in the district. The law also uh, doesn't require intent. So the district having a system that is still at large doesn't, you know, the not intending for it to violate the CVRA doesn't matter. And so it makes it very easy for someone to bring a claim against a government entity like a school district or a city. Um, also, those entities can then, um, those plaintiffs can uh, essentially um, acquire attorney's fees for their costs and expert fees for suing a school district, a city, a county, but um, the public entity defending itself has not afforded that same right. Um, so what is a by trustee area system that would make it safe from CVRA litigation? Um, so the district will be divided into five roughly equal population areas, total population, and a board member will be elected from each trustee area only by the voters who live in that same area. So eventually there'll be one trustee per area. Um, now, importantly, all of you have been lawfully elected. So if the new maps don't perfectly align with the current map, that's fine. Um, you know, you all serve out your full term regardless. So again, this is the district current for at large hybrid map. Um, and this doesn't necessarily meet the legal requirements because voters still elect all of you at large and not just from the areas that you live in. It's not clicking anymore. Oh, there we go. So again, right now we're on kind of step two of the process. Step one was adopting a resolution. Step two is these two public hearings where the board and the community can give suggestions and thoughts about how these maps might be drawn. Chris. Thank you, John. Um, thank you, board. 
So um, we now have uh, some um, state adjusted 2020 census data. So we, because of the timing, we're not able to update this presentation, but I will, uh, um, I guess, communicate some of the highlights. All right, so um, the district gained about 10% overall in district-wide population. Uh, you guys gained about 8,995 people as a whole. And as far as composition of the total population, uh, the Hispanic Latino population still is at the top with 71% and the white uh, population actually decreased down to 18% from 26%. Um, uh, as far as the uh, citizens voting age population, um, there is not much change either as far as the, the ranking. Um, there's a plus or minus a few points here and there, but the order of um, the highest ranking classes are is just about the same. So this is a map. Again, this is this is still based on census uh, from 2020. Um, this map demonstrates the highest concentration of the Hispanic voting age population across the district. Um, as you can see, some of the areas that are, are shaded in a cream color, that represents the lowest concentration of the population. Uh, that could be anywhere from zero to 10%. Most likely these areas have low concentrations because they're non-residential areas or commercial areas. Those areas that are uh, in uh, orange or dark red, that represents the highest concentrations of this uh, particular class. Uh, you can see some of the concentrations uh, are highest around Miraloma or around, around the uh, Rubido area. Okay. With that, I'll turn it back to John. Thanks. So the, the screen showed the 2010 census data, but the 2020 data is now out. And the district gained about 9,000 people, as Chris said. So there's about 105,000 people in the district. So the trustee areas will have about 21,100 something per area, plus or minus a few uh, when the maps are drawn compared to the 96,000, which would have been about 20, uh, a little bit less than 20,000, about 19,000 per area previously. Um, so the point of today's public hearing is to ask the board and the community sort of how these lines should be drawn. Um, you know, I'd like neighborhood X and neighborhood Y to stay in the same area or I think such and such road or street or landmark makes sense as a boundary because uh, you know it makes sense geographically. Um, or I think all of such and such communities should be in one area or each middle school boundary should have multiple or single trustee areas. Um, these are the kinds of feedback we're looking for so that when Chris goes back and starts working on these maps this week, um, we can have input prior to just, um, you know, kind of going from from scratch you know you all live in this community you know it better than we do and so your feedback to give some ideas of how um, thematically the map should look is helpful um, so next uh, i'll talk to uh, chris i'll come back up here and give you the details of how they go about making the maps all right so as john said um after this uh, second public meeting we'll go ahead and, and uh, go to the office and start drawing some of these maps based on the 2020 census data and we'll follow specific criteria and incorporate the feedback from the public that we gained from last meeting in this meeting and uh, we'll start drawing areas with uh, which ensure the rough um, equal population around 20,000 or so and make sure that we uh, maintain every single uh, area within a certain deviation we're not going to be able to do a perfect job to equally divide it but there is allowances for some deviation Okay. Um, so other things to keep in mind. So the California Constitution dictates uh, other criteria that we must consider when drawing these areas. So for example, uh, the voting district shall comply with the U.S. Constitution and shall achieve, um, achieve popularity equality as nearly as practical. The voting district shall comply with the Federal Voting Rights Act and uh, the voting district shall be geographically contiguous. So that means that we cannot have uh, multiple part districts that cannot be separated in any kind of way. You have to be one piece. Um, we have to keep in mind local communities of interest, which in essence is uh, areas with dis uh, within the district that share common social and economic interests, such as uh, living standards and work opportunities. Uh, next, uh, geographical compactness. So that means that the district has to stay as regularly shaped as possible. We cannot have a district that has, you know, appendages that, you know, shoot out of the center mass and just try to grab some communities just for the sake of balancing numbers or other uh, motives. Uh, voting districts shall not be drawn uh, for the purpose of favoring or discriminating against an incumbent political party uh, or a candidate. 
And this is one of the reasons why we talked about the Hispanic citizen voting age population as an example, because the point of the CVRA is not to decrease the ability of protected class members from influencing the outcome of an election. So if you, there is concentrated areas of protected classes, you don't want to split them in half because then you're diluting voting power. You also don't want to reach around and try to get everybody into the same area because that's kind of the opposite effect. So just the, the really, you don't want to be cracking those areas to the extent that it's possible. Um, so again, final thoughts, this doesn't change the district's overall boundaries or where anybody goes to school. It doesn't even change how the board is governed. It's the one district with common goals and challenges. Um, after tonight's meeting, this is a, another kind of big turning point. Now the data is out there. Um, Chris and his team will draw trustee area map options, probably about three of them. And uh, at least by the end of uh, this month, they'll be shared with the district and the community for feedback. And there'll be three public hearings on those options. The options can also evolve. If folks like a certain option or want to see something new, you can give direction and a new map can be created as the process goes along. As long as it's publicized seven days before the final meeting, it can be voted on by the board. And so with that, we will uh, stand back for any questions or any public comment and, and respond to thereafter. President Bradford. Please, Trustee Garcia. Thank you. Uh, I've got a question. I didn't didn't see this last time, but I, on the slide that it shows census blocks. So is each one of those, so not every street is drawn here maybe because they're not census blocks, right? So, um, so we can't cut into like a census block to one or the other. It's got to be part of that trustee area. Is that correct? Yeah, the census block can't be split because that's kind of those are kind of the Lego pieces, more or less, of how these areas get built because you know exactly how many people live in each census block based on the census. And so you can't split one when you're drawing a trustee area map because then you don't actually have um, sort of certainty of how many people live in each area anymore. So if there's a census block with 500 people in it and we arbitrarily say, you know, this street in the middle is going to be in area two and this one's going to be in area three, we now no longer know how many people are in each trustee area because we're kind of guessing. But so keeping the blocks together ensures that we know how many people are in each area and lets us ensure that there's equal population. So the census block uh, diagram, each one of those lines, let's say you got a square, that's a, that's actually, uh, it's the one with the, um, like the cream colored, I think maybe before this one or after this one. Yeah, after this one. So each one of those represents a block. If it's if it's outlined, it's a it's a census block. So um, let me uh, give you a little clarification. The uh, the gray lines are the actual outlines of the census blocks. The the white uh, lines and yellow um, orange lines uh, are represents major roads and the highway. So that's the 15 going up north and south, and the uh, the 60 going west and east. Yeah. But the gray lines are where you really should be concentrating as far as the geography of each block. Yeah. So. So if you see uh, a gray line, let's say you got a street, it's two streets and and one street is is a is a square and the other street's a square. Those are two census blocks. Right. Okay. Yes. Okay. That's all I had. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation again. Trustee Dittweiler. Thank you, President Bradford. Uh, this mic doesn't like me. Um, I got a question. H how do you dilute a protected class when it's a 60% majority? That doesn't seem geometrically possible to me. So I'll, I'll give an example. And obviously, we're not going to do this. Um, but there, you know, if you look at the kind of the, the eastern portion of the district, there's a lot of dark red there. And so if... Um, Chris arbitrarily kind of cut a line down the middle of it. Let's say district wide, what's the citizen voting age population of, well, I'll go back a slide. So dis district wide, um, the Hispanic Latino population is about 60%. And so that's district wide, but perhaps in this area here, if that ends up becoming a trustee area, for example, it might be 80%. But if we drew a line that split it, it might make it below 60%, for example, where it really should be compact and make sense. So um, that's kind of how that works. Unfortunately, there's no minimum threshold requirement under the CVRA that says, oh, if you have this percentage of a protected class, you're safe. Everybody's exposed with how the law is written. And so we just have to do our best to follow the law in, in creating the map of options.
Trustee Regal. <laughs> Sorry, um, I do have several questions, um, but Trustee Garcia and Dr. Ditwell, they were kind of followed up. So the information you're sharing now is the 2010, the district demographics, correct? On the screen, yes, but um, we just received the 2020 data. And so, I mean, we, we can go line by line with it, but we figured you just sort of wanted the idea, which is it went from 96, 645 to 105 and change. Okay. Um, and the ratio stayed more or less the same. And that's um, where you mentioned that's about a 21,000 resident increase per trustee area? Not per area. When the maps will be drawn, each trustee area will have about 21,000 oh, people me, 21, in it because 21,000 times five will be 105. Okay. And then um, on the, the schedule, so you're saying November 15th, you're going to probably have a couple of visuals of some suggested maps? November 8th. No, November 8th. And really the maps have to be available. Oh, me, November 8th. Yes, a week before each hearing. So the maps will be available sometime this month and they'll be shared on the district website and pushed out to the community on social media as well. And then our presentation will be adjusted from, hey, tell us what you think the map should look like to this is what the maps options are. This is the breakdown demographically of each option. And then tell us what you like or don't like about each map. Okay. And so, and as Trustee Garcia mentioned, how the draws, the, the line should be drawn is the gray on the map is where we're looking at clustering within the areas. Right. So, so think about um, the, the census blocks as the puzzle pieces overall. So each individual piece will be grouped together to neighboring uh, census blocks to form an overall district. And based on the, the, the data that is, that is um, uh, behind the scenes on each block, meaning, you know, what's the breakdown in populations and by the protected classes, we will aggregate that information and produce those tables. So that's the key part is we're grouping these uh, census blocks to okay. form uh, each each district or each trustee area. Okay, and, and I'm sure you're pretty seasoned at this. One of the um, comments that I want to factor in is the balancing of the number of schools. Since I mean, ultimately, we are all responsible for throughout the entire district. However, the balance of the number of campuses is is so off. I mean, President Bradford has three. I think I have four. Trustee Garcia has seven or eight, eight, and then I believe three, and then um, Dr. Ditweather has four or five. So it's it's. I know it's going to be very challenging the the way these campuses are mapped out through our city. But I, if we're going to increase that um, direct relation with our constituents, voters within the trustee areas, I really think that the number of schools would also have an impact by trustee area. That's excellent feedback and something that, you know, Chris and his team will take into consideration when they draw at least one of the options. It'll be an option that tries to evenly as best as possible. Obviously, we got to keep even population, but as best as possible, that could be one of the options of trying to split school sites amongst the five trustee areas um, or potentially in addition to that, an option that splits up trustee uh, attendance areas between multiple um, multiple trustee areas. So for example, if you have a, a school, perhaps a, a trustee area will, there'll be two trustee areas that are residents go to that school, even if the school is in one of the areas so that you still have constituents in multiple, you know, with multiple trustees, essentially. There's different ways of looking at it. Right, I know that's gonna be challenging. I mean, there's a couple of us here that like our, our children never attend the school within our trustee areas. I mean, it just, I think it's gonna be very difficult. But also um, one thing, if you can clarify, with the listeners and, and the attendees and, and the rest of the board is, you know, there's a chance that some of us may lose our seats just because the way the realignment, um, I believe three or four of us actually sit on borders within the city. So that's something that if we can clarify how that's gonna work out, if the redistricting impacts where the current board member resides. Yes. So again, first, you all serve out your full terms regardless, no matter where you live. If two of you are next door neighbors and you're running on the same term, there's a chance you're going to end up in the same trustee area, right? Um, but regardless, even if you do, you still serve till your term expires in 22 or 24. Um, sometimes when these maps are drawn, 
it just so happens that trustees are able to end up in their own trustee area. It also oftentimes happens that trustees get paired together and there ends up being a trustee area with no trustee, in which case eventually over time, each election cycle will eventually fill, fill it out so there's one per area. So it's, it's, it's possible that there are pairings, it's possible there's not. Thank you. Does the board have more questions before I move to the public? Dr. Dittweiler? Uh, it's not a question, but it's an observation. The, the city of Yerupa Valley is a synthetic city that was built out of, uh, what do they call them, census designated places. Uh, I've only lived here 10 years, so I don't really have enough experience to know whether those census designated places still have their own sense of there or not. But that might be another option to look at when you're drawing a map. We, we can, sorry, um, we can take a look at that. Um, did, uh, I think the city incorporated not too long ago. 2011? 2011, yeah. So um, there will definitely not be a, a CDP for that. It's, it's its own city now since it's incorporated. But um, we can use it. We can use it as a guide to look at, to see how the numbers fall. But uh, it, it really, is, it's still down to the population. But thematically, I mean, if that's uh, something that the board wants us to look at, you know, maybe one map option is um, drawing yeah, the map in a way to try to balance each school site. One map might be looking at some of those um, previously unincorporated areas as potentially separate areas. One option might be looking at the current map and trying to um, make the population work as close as possible to the current map as well. So there, there's different looks that the team is going to present. They won't all look the same. Otherwise, why have options? President Bradford. Please. So I think Dr. Dittweiler was talking about like Rubido, Glen Avon, Miraloma, Pedley, Indian yeah. Hills, just to kind of clarify. Yeah, no, I, I, I understood that. So meaning yeah. like maybe, okay. maybe this will be around a trustee area, maybe this will be around a trustee area, potentially, or at least as the base of one. It's possible, yeah. I'd like to add that it, it breaks down even farther. There's Miraloma and old Miraloma or Sky Country and Old Mariloma. So there's definitely a sense of self for, and everybody hates East Fail. <laughs> so, but, but that's not part of our city, so. <laughs> but it is part of our district <laughs> because they came in and wanted our tax dollars to fund their city, so. Uh, but that's just my opinion. I could be wrong. Okay. Um, so are you asking us to literally tell you how do you want us to tell you? Well, I mean, this thematically, this has actually been really helpful. It sounds like the feedback is there um, that there's an appetite for a map that maybe tries to balance school sites across trustee areas. There's an appetite for a map that looks at some of the more traditional communities. Um, there's an appetite potentially. I, I didn't hear it, but I just threw it out there of, you know, our current map, if we like it, we can try to make something that still works or based on the current map. Um, obviously, we got to balance the population, but to the extent that that's possible, something similar. Um, so those are kind of the ideas. I mean, it, you know, at the same time, if you want to get more into the nuts and bolts, you can do that. You can say, you know, I think, um, you know, the 60 should not cross, you know, lines that should be a line, that kind of thing. I mean, it's really up to you. You can look at our city seal and our city motto, which is a community of communities and enumerate our communities, Glen Avon, Rubido, Miraloma, Sunny Slope, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And see those are our sense of communities of people who have lived here for generations and, okay. And Trustee Riggle has one. We're going to count them, boys and girls. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. Um, th there's quite a bit of, uh, bit of de development within our communities that we would foresee homes opening up in the next year, potentially two years. Um, it looks like there's going to be a high volume. Um, the city council is, you know, working on currently. Is that going to be factored in, or is it since they're not there, we're not going to even consider those numbers? I mean, we're looking at hundreds of homes. Is that going to have any impact? 
So the map still needs to be balanced based on the actual census data. And again, balanced plus or minus 10%, because again, not every census block is a perfect even number. It's not going to perfectly be even, but it'll be pretty close. Um, so that's what we have to do. We can't break that because then it, it means that there are some communities that are basically have more people, but the same number of representatives or less people than the same number of representatives. So can't break that, but you can potentially foresee that if you know that one section of a district is going to have a lot of homes built the next 10 years, you can potentially intentionally give that district a little bit less population, but still in the variance, knowing that by the time the next census comes out, it'll catch up. Every time a new census comes out, the district must, you know, so let's say it's December, you guys pick a map, you know, and that's the map for the next decade. In 2031, when the census comes out, you have to put the new census data onto your map and see if it's still balanced. And if it is, you reapprove the same map. If it's not, you have to adjust to get the balance back. So um, it sounds like there's going to be significant growth in the district, certainly over the next few years and possibly over the next decade. And that might impact what happens in 2031 when you have to adjust your map. So you could, again, potentially underpopulate an area now knowing that there's actually going to be more people growing there but you have to still keep it in the range okay we have a public hearing to get to but trustee garcia thank you president brad just one final question um and yeah maybe you covered this if you did i apologize so the current trustee map do you know that it that it does have equal population it meets the requirement so we, know that yet. We, we don't know, but I, I believe that Chris looked at it and the current map splits some census blocks. So it can't possibly be perfectly the same as it is now, setting aside the population issue. Um, but um, again, that's thematically going to be one of the things. But the law requires that all of these public hearings happen and that the district seek as much feedback as possible. So we, we even though I know that wasn't your intention of the question, we can't just say, oh, if this one was still good, we're just going to go with it. Yeah. We have to go through the public hearing process. But um, offhand, I do not know if they're evenly balanced. Got it. Thank you. Moving along, we will now convene a public hearing to receive public testimony concerning the composition of potential trustee voting areas associated with the district's transition to a by trustee election system in advance of the preparation of draft, draft trustee voting area plans by the district's demographer. Under California Elections Code Section 10010, the board must hold at least two public hearings over a period of no more than 30 days at which the public is invited to provide input regarding the composition of the districts before drawing draft maps of the proposed boundaries of the district. As part of this public hearing, members of the public may submit comments on the establishment of voting area boundaries for the new trustee voting areas that will be established as part of the district's transition from an at-large election election system to a by trustee area election system. Speakers will be given three minutes to make comments on this matter and this matter only. We have received cards from one person who wishes to address the subject during the public hearing, Lisa Cook. Welcome to the podium. Thank you, board and cabinet. My name is Lisa Cook, and I, I guess I'm the public tonight. Um, and and I have been a member of this public since 1966. So I guess um, I, I guess I'm good to be up here and, and represent a lot of the Arupa Valley um, members. But um, a lot of you, a lot of what you covered tonight, you know, is already on on my concerns. And um, thank you so much for explaining the process. Wow. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot to there's a lot to go on with this. Um, I had a, a couple of questions. I don't know if I can ask questions and have you respond up here, but um, it's like I said, it's a huge learning process. One of the things um, I heard mentioned was, and, and I'm not sure if I'm hearing it correctly, fanatically or phonetically, we're looking at things. So uh, as a teacher, um, I, I just kind of want to know what that word meant. So if we could address that maybe as part of our process. Oh, thematic. oh thematically. Thank you so much for that. Thematically. So that works for me. 
Um, and I share a lot of the concerns that were mentioned by the board. Um, of course, you know, we need to look at the California Voting Rights Act. Um, also, the school attendance boundaries, you know, it would be really ideal if you know, like Camino Real isn't split between two different trustees. So if we could look at, at our current um, our current school attendance boundaries, that would be something I'd recommend. The um, the our, our map that we have now for our trustees, I feel like um, like they were talking about it, it's fine, but it does congregate a lot of our schools in one area. So a trustee has, you know, a lot more schools than, than another trustee. I don't know if that, is, I mean, that's a lot more work for the trustee in that area, but um, I, I don't know that it would um, be as, as much of a problem as it is now when it comes to voting. Like um, if you're in an area where you have, let's say eight schools, you're probably gonna have more voter turnout with those eight schools and the parents who are more invested in the process. So I think that if you have one representative for one area, not having exactly the same number of schools um, isn't entirely crucial, but it, it is ideal to split them if we can, just another something to look at. Um, what else? I can't read. I took so many notes on what you were saying today. Um, I love the idea of a variety of maps. I think that's going to be huge. Um, you know, we're not going to, we're probably not going to have one map that, um, that everyone loves. So it'll be great to have choices. Um, let's see what else. Oh, the one of, one of my big things is I loved, um, I think it was Robert talking about, or might have been, it might have been Robert and Karen, you talked about Arupa Valley being a city of cities. I think that that's going to be huge if we could really factor in our cities like Pedley, Miraloma, Glen Avon, because they do have their own distinct personality. So if we consider that when creating the boundaries. And then the other thing is our board members, um, as far as like my being a voter in the area, having continuity of representation, clearly that's, we're not going to look at their address and form the boundaries around where they live and, and make the boundaries that way. But I think it is one of the factors that we should look at when creating the boundaries, where our current trustees live, um, and as far as continuity of representation, if we can factor in where they live, um, that, that should be a part of the equation. Okay, I think that's all. And um, yeah, this is, where the, this is where it gets difficult, but um, I think this is a really important process. And I'd like to thank the board and the cabinet for moving in this direction. So thank you. Thank you, did that spark any more questions? All right, gentlemen, did you think of anything else that you would like to add before you depart us tonight? Uh, no, nothing new. Just, you know, we'll see how the maps come out and we'll look forward to hearing the board and the community's feedback in November. All right, Superintendent Hanson. No, I appreciate the questions that were asked tonight and the public uh, comments. This whole process is very important for the demographers to go ahead and draft these options. So thank you very much for your for your questions and your input. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Have a good night. Moving along to item number three of the public hearings. This is on the proposed annexation of territory into community facilities, district number 16. Mrs. Ford. Thank you. As part of the legal requirements for annexing properties into community facilities, district number 16, a public hearing must be held on the proposed annexation, including the proposed levy of special taxes and all other matters discussed in the resolution of intention. A copy of the public hearing notice is included in your backup materials. Thank you. This is the time and place for the public hearing for the proposed annexation of certain property into the community facilities district number 16 of the Harupa Unified School District, the CFD, including the proposed levy of special taxes therein and all other matters discussed in the resolution of intention previously adopted. Notice of the public hearing has been duly published and posted in accordance with the law. 
We will receive comments and questions in any written or oral protests from any interested persons. When all comments have been received, the hearing will be closed. Mrs. Worley, are there any public comments? Seeing none. All right. The public hearing is hereby closed. No written protests to the formation of the CFD were received. Do we need to take a break? Okay, let's uh, party on Garth. Uh, let's see. If you would please refresh your tablets. All right, action section, session A. Gentlemen, are we all right? Yeah. Thank you. Do you need a charge card? Okay, I have one if you need it. A, approve, adopt routine action items by consent. Administration recommends the board approve, adopt routine action items A, 1 through 26 as printed. I will entertain a motion. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Is there any discussion? Call for the vote, please. I'm sorry. Mr. Lewis, is our technology asleep? I can't hear you. Oh, okay. All votes were recorded at past five zero. Thank you. <clears throat> Item B, adopt resolution number 2022-12, resolution authorizing the conveyance of a right-of-way to City of Harupa Valley at Pedley, elementary school, Mrs. Ford. Thank you. Um, in conjunction with the public hearing that we held earlier this evening, administration is recommending the board adopt resolution number 2022-12, authorizing the conveyance of a right of way to the city of Perupa Valley at Pedley Elementary School. So moved. Okay. Sir. Thank you. Do we have any discussion on this? Nope, nope. Call for the vote, please. Motion passes. Item C, adopt resolution number 2022-13, acting as the legislative body of community facilities district number 16 of the Harupa Unified School District, calling a special election. I will entertain a motion. I move. Thank you. I will second. Thank you. Call for the vote, please. Motion passes. And I would like to announce that the district has previously received a consent and waiver to the annexation of the property into the CFD. So can the clerk as the election official confirm receipt of a ballot from the owner of the property to be annexed? Yes, we've received a sealed ballot. All of the votes on which are in favor of the annexation of the property and vote on the CFD. Thank you. Item D, adopt resolution number 2022-14, acting as the legislative body of community facilities district number 16 of the Harupa Unified School District, certifying the election results for the annexation of certain territory into said community facilities district number 16, Mrs. Ford. As a, as a required step in the formation process, the board is to consider adopting this resolution that certifies the election results that we just, just had and confirming a special election was held and 
certifying the total number of votes cast. Move to approve. We can do that. I will second. Thank you. Is there any discussion on this? Hey, let's go for it. Call for the vote, please. The clerk, thank you, the motion passes. The clerk of the board will execute the certificate of election official read the cast votes. Thank you. Item E, review at a first reading ordinance number 2022-01 as the legislative body of the community facilities district number 16 of the Hope Unified School District authorizing the levy of a special tax within territory annexed into community facilities district number 16. Mrs. Ford. Thank you. So this is just the first reading of the ordinance for, uh, uh, for CFD 16 to authorize the levy of special taxes within the territory being annexed. Um, and we will bring this back to the board for approval of, at a second reading. Okay. I will entertain a motion. Move to approve. Thank second. You. Thank you. Any discussion on this? Nope. All right. Call for the vote, please. Excuse me, President Bradford. Yes. We're actually not voting on this item this evening. Oh. Our action will be taken until the next meeting. You're right. Thank you. Thank you. Step that remark. In that case, let's wrap it up. Board member committee reports. Let's start with you, Trustee Garcia. Thank you, President Bradford. I don't have any reports tonight, but I do. I just want to again encourage folks to, to get out and get vaccinated. Uh, you know, vaccines FDA approved. I know the boosters are out for Pfizer. Uh, it's very important that we get a handle on this. So I want to encourage, uh, there's no excuse, they're everywhere. And so please get out and, and vaccinate. And finally, I want to thank Ms. Cook for coming tonight to, to speak at our public hearing. And I want to encourage uh, everyone out there come to the next hearings and uh, you know uh, this is a community process like I said last meeting you know you can otherwise the board's just going to do we're going to draw the lines and we need more input from the community um, and also want to kind of remind everyone I don't know where the idea of trustee areas uh, you only represent those schools um, bless you we are um, we're not exactly like a city where you know you got your constituents and and you advocate for for your district uh, in the schools we advocate for all schools so all schools are our schools so um, I, I don't know how I got lucky I got eight schools including a high school um, but uh, and a middle school and several elementary schools but um, we represent the entire group unified school district and I just want to let everyone know out there that that's 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 the way it should be you know uh, our constituents whether they elect us or not are throughout the entire district so that concludes my comments thank you thank you you're looking at me trustee Navarro thank you president Bradford uh, I agree and concur with uh, trustee Garcia um, I want to hear more from the public. I want to hear your opinion. I want to hear what you think about, you know, redistricting and, and drawing these lines. I, I feel like <clears throat> sometimes I'm sad that we don't get enough input back from the public. Tell us we're doing good. Tell us we're doing bad. I, w I want to hear it. So we're, we're up for that challenge. And, uh, and we do represent the district as a whole. Some of us might not have as many schools, but every student in this district, district is number one in our eyes. So, um, that is it. I have a, there's a community technology meeting tomorrow, but I have a prior obligation obligation tomorrow so I won't be able to attend uh, but that is it for me. Trustee Rogel, how about you? Thank you President Bradford. Um, I do not have any committee reports at this time. Um, just you know want to give everybody some support to please hang in there as we continue. Um, Daniel's team is trying to staff up. It is a continuous effort. 
uh, to get everybody on board or finding staff, but also out there, if you know people are looking for a job, send them to our website because we really have quite a few places uh, or positions to fill. That's all I have for this evening. Thank you. Trustee David Waller. Okay, well, uh, best of the best, Matt, and I guess we're going to hear about that in the next meeting. Is that right? Okay. Um, technology meets tomorrow, and I look forward to that and hope we get to talk about how we use the tools as well as what cool tools we have. I served as a validator for the California School Board Association's Golden Bell Award. I validated Desert Sands Learning Academy, which is a leadership pipeline development tool. It is different in that it is open to all staff, management, certificated, and classified. They also have articulation agreements with several graduate schools of education who waive units and other requirements for people who successfully complete the 15-month program. We talked a little about the pros and cons of relying on internal promotion and decided that it was necessary, but that we should think about some sort of administrator exchange to encourage cross-pollinization of ideas. Thank you. As Trustee Garcia was talking about being concerned about not just our own schools, but all of the schools, it reminded me of one of Arthur Miller's most famous plays called All My Sons about uh, a plane crash in World War II where the protagonist felt responsible for it. And he said it was not just his own son, but they were all of our sons and that we should mourn for all of them. So that's, that's the way I think about the students in our district, that they're all of our children. And when we re feel responsible for other people's children, the way we feel responsible and loving for our own, that's, that's when we're responsible members of our community that it's, it's not just the, the people who are physically related to us or the people who are next door or some, some meaning because of prior commitments, but when we truly are our brother's keepers. So, Superintendent Dr. Hansen, do you have any final comments for October 4th? Just want to thank the board this evening for your diligence during that um, that presentation on trustee areas. It's very important to receive the input and feedback, not only from the from from you as board members, but the community. And so, uh, as you all have mentioned, that's a very important part of the process uh, to assist uh, in de in developing those areas. And then, lastly, just want to thank our classified staff and our teachers. Uh, our administrators, all of our staff members who are working diligently during these very challenging times, um, you know, wouldn't be possible without their their hard work and their efforts in navigating these uh, very difficult times. And so we certainly appreciate um, all the learning that is taking place in Harupa uh, and the efforts that are provided there by our, our staff members. So thank you for that. And we'll get through it together as we continue to wrestle mm -hmm. with these challenges. I uh, feel confident that we'll be able to overcome them and, and come out on top. So thank you again, everybody, for being here tonight. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate your willingness to sit through all of this with us on Monday nights when you have many other and more interesting things to do, but this is for our children's benefits. So continue to be safe, and thank you so much. This meeting is adjourned.